Amen, amen. Go ahead and have your seat. And we'll now dismiss um, our children um, to Children's Church. And you can be turning your Bibles uh, now to Acts 9. Acts 9. Yes. And as you're turning in your Bibles, I want to give you a little tidbit of information. Today is Joe uh, Lang's 70th birthday. Jo- the, what? John? Joe Long. Oh, I thought I said, okay, Lang. Joe, Joe, today is your 70th birthday. Amen. I thought you were like 55. Yeah, I did. Okay. I tell you, uh, he came in earlier this week and brought me some CDs to my office. And I apologize. It, it's not your handwriting. It's my bad eyes. Um, <laughs> you know, I can't hardly read a thing some days. But he came in and you are talented. He brought me some CDs with some um, people singing and you were one of them. And I tell you what, folks, um, listen to you sing at some of these funerals I've been going to. Uh, you have no doubt blessed many over the years with your talent that God has richly blessed you with. And, and aren't we blessed at Del Norte to have him coming and being a part of our church family? Aren't we blessed? When I was asking the Lord for a friend in the ministry, when I came out here, uh, God blessed me with Joe. And he's come in and, and shared in his heart and his wisdom with me. And, and uh, you know, he's just been through so much in life. He has so much to offer. This morning, I want to talk to you about the signs of a converted heart, the signs of a converted heart. I felt led to share this with you because we had Easter last week, and, and uh, we did. We had over 400. You know, Easter's always a big Sunday. We had over, four, I think, 431, and the week before that, we had like 405. And, and to my knowledge, uh, and, you know, Kevin, if I'm wrong, can, can fix me, but um, I think, I think that's the first time we had over 400 in consecutive weeks in, in almost eight or 10 years. So uh, that just goes to show you that God's doing some neat things here and people are getting saved and baptized and joining the church. And, and I'm so grateful to be a part of this church family. And, and after Easter, I was sitting there wondering, I said, Father, what would you have me to speak on? And one of the questions that's asked of me so often is, Pastor, how do you really know? How do you know if someone really is saved how do you know if their life really is changed and there's a lot of examples we can use in our te- in the bible but in our text today i want to talk to you about paul and when i was thinking who was uh, someone like uh, in modern day that we know that could be a lot like paul and i got to think i love christmas uh, uh, some of you may or may not but i love the christmas season and one of my favorite movies is the scrooge and, uh, you know, I know that's crazy, isn't it? So how do you like the Scrooge? He's mean, he's mean, he's greedy, he's selfish, he's, he's self-centered, he's all about him and how he can prosper. But what's interesting about the movie Scrooge is he has some really great house guests the night before, and they just show up randomly. And then by the time he wakes up the next morning, his heart is completely changed. He's not what he once was. This greedy, selfish man is now all about helping others and loving others and caring about those that God has placed in his life. Well, folks, that's exactly what happened to Paul on the road to Damascus. And that's where we're going to find um, um, Paul today. He's on the road to Damascus. He's on there because he's really, he really hates Christians. Matter of fact, Paul was, was one of the greatest persecutors of Christians in all of the church history. We get over half our Bible from him, over half our New Testament from him. But yet he was a huge persecutor of the church until God stepped in. Folks, God can change hearts. God can change anything and everything. God can do anything he wants. So with that being said, let's pick up our text today. Acts 9, it's 1 through 22, but we're just going to read 1 through 10 or 11 at this time, and then we'll kind of pick up the others as we go. So in Acts 9, starting in verse 1, And Saul, yet breathing and threatening and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went, into, went unto the high priest, and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, that was before Christians were called um, before the church was really established, uh, they were called the way. That was kind of their title. Um, it was the way. So, 
any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about, round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were open, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And as he was there three days without sight, and neither did he eat or drink. Let us pray. Father, I love you. I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for this time. And Lord, I pray that we would truly understand what a changed life and heart looks like. I believe we live in a day and a time where deception can step in. So Lord, I pray that we can, through the life and the, uh, of Paul and his example, we can learn a few things that would encourage us, help us, and Lord, identify to us as well. So Father, you have your hand on this time. Lord, have your hand on our hearts and our lives. God, forgive us where we sinned. Forgive us where we've fallen short. Forgive us where we have rebelled. Lord, let no enmity stand between us and you to this day. So Father, I pray that I'd be nothing but a broken vessel restored only through the power of the Holy Spirit to share your word. Lord, it's your word. And I pray, God, that we would learn and live by it. In Jesus' name, all God's children say, amen. In the life of Paul on his journey to Damascus, we, we see a, a life-changing experience take place in the life of Paul. Now, the scriptures say Saul, um, but later on, God changed his name to Paul. But we see something that is radical. And folks, here's the thing. It's okay to be a little bit radical for Jesus. It's okay to be a little bit of what some people call a Jesus freak. Matter of fact, we don't have enough of them. We're, we're so worried about what people might think. We're not, we're, we've forgotten what it means to think about what God feels and wants for us. So what are some signs of a converted heart? What are some signs of one that has truly given their life to Christ? Well, here's some things I picked up when studying the scripture this week. The first thing is, it's a humbled heart. One of the greatest examples of Paul um, being converted to Christ and have a converted heart is one that's humble. Look what it says in verse 4. Very briefly, it says, and falling to the ground. Now, Paul fell to the ground because he realized that what he was experiencing was greater than him. It, he wasn't equal to it. He, he wasn't even able to comprehend it. As soon as he was before the presence of God, he humbled himself to the ground. Now, folks, we're not talking about how someone goes to the ground and, and gets on one bended knee. What it's saying here, he went to the ground. When you say the scriptures, he got down and put his face in the dirt. He humbled himself before God. You see, when he truly was before the presence of the Lord, he realized that he was very inadequate. My friends, for those of us that truly, truly have Christ in our life, we're always humble before the Lord. And let me tell you this, if there's anyone that ever says they have Christ in their life, but they don't have a humble attitude toward Christ and God's scriptures, you need to be weary of them. Because the word of God says, be careful because our pride and our arrogance and our own personal knowledge and wisdom can lead us astray. That we should always be humble before God in his teachings. That's one of the greatest signs of a converted heart. Psalms 25, 9 says, He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. Psalms 149, 4. 
For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with redemption. What does that mean? Only those that have Christ in their life have salvation, have redemption. Only the humble heart toward Christ. But only do we see a humble heart, we, we see one that recognizes Jesus' sovereignty. Look what it says in verse 6. And he trembling and astonished. Trembling here means to be fearful. Paul knew that his authority in this situation was nothing compared to the one that was before him. Now understand this, Paul's a, a pretty powerful man at this point. He has papers, he has authority. He brings uh, the authority of the church leadership or, or the religious establishment that day. He brings it before all people. People quivered and feared in the presence of Paul. Paul was someone, if he walked in this room today and, and, he, and he walked in, we'd all pay honor to him because that's the type of man he was. But yet in the presence of the Lord, his sovereignty was minuscule, absolutely nothing. He had no power. Folks, Christ is the one that has the power of all things. He's the sovereign. Matter of fact, I, I, I've said it many times, I'll say it again. Either Christ is sovereign of your heart or he's sovereign of nothing. He can't be the sovereign of your intellect. He can't be the sovereign of just your thoughts. He must be the sovereign of all things in your life, in every aspect of your life, to truly, fully comprehend. That's a hard one to grasp. Or at least it was for me. But we grow. You see, we live in a day, much like in the old days, it talks about in Judges, where everybody did their own thing and did as they wanted. Everybody did what's right in their own mind in that day, and we do to this day. One of my neighbors, I just being honest, with you, I'm in a in a good neighborhood, but one of my neighbors apparently uh, lost their uh, um, how do you say this? Well, they just they just lost it yesterday, and they had some visits from the police. And uh, yeah, it, it, it shocked us too. We're sitting out in the backyard going like, okay. And, the, and they kept saying, look, if you'll just stop hollering, if you'll just stop using this foul language, if you'll just calm down, I'll do what I want. I'll do what I want. I'll say what I want. And you know what she did with all her wants? She went to jail. Yes, I live in a wonderful neighborhood. I know it's funny. We were laughing too, but here's the thing. Folks, when we stand before God, we can say everything we want, but God's sovereign. Well, God, I, I think you kind of meant it this way. God, I kind of think you, God's sovereign. Psalms 103, 19, the Lord had prepared his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rule over all. Proverbs 16, 4, the Lord hath made all things for himself. You were made for God. Whether you choose to live for him or not, it doesn't change the fact that you were not made. You were all made. I was made. Every creation, that everything that's been created was made for God and God alone. God is sovereign. And folks, let me tell you something. He's still sovereign, even in the United States of America. Even if we choose to say we won't have prayer, we won't read this Bible, and we won't recognize him at the highest level of God, God's still sovereign of all. Thirdly, he asked for guidance. He asked for guidance. Direction in life seems to be one of the greatest struggles. Should I buy this? Should I go here? Should I do this? Should I do that? But yet for a truly converted heart, for someone that truly has Christ in their life, they seek guidance from the Lord. Paul it's a great example. Verse 6. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? This shows us that through his response, that he recognized, you really are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It really is yours. And, and, and from this day forward, I ask, what do you want me to do? He humbled his heart. Understanding that God was sovereign and says, what would you have me to do? 
Folks, it, it, that's not an easy one to get, is it? Asking God for guidance. And it's easy to ask, but it's not always the easiest to, to listen to. But Paul here simply said, what would you have me to do? I believe that some of us here today, the situations we're in, if we would just ask that question, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Instead of asking everyone else, God, what do you want me to do? Look at Paul. Did he turn around and said, look, guys, uh, what do you think we ought to do about this? He asked the sovereign creator of the universe, what would you have me to do? I don't care what the rest of the world says I ought to do. What do you want? What would our church be like? What would your families or your own personal heart be like if you really just focused on what God would have you to do instead of everyone else? It's hard being a people pleaser. It's hard trying to reach out and make everyone happy. You're not going to do it. There's going to be some that love you for what you do and some that hate you. Trust me, I've been in the public arena for many years now. I've been a pastor for so long, I've figured it out. Some people are going to like me, some people aren't. I can sleep with that at night. I couldn't at first. It bothered me. I tried to make everyone happy. I tried to please everyone. But no matter how much I tried to please everyone, someone was always out there chewing at my heels. And then around 14, 15 years ago, I said, Father, I'm going to burn out. I'm not going to be able to make this. This is impossible. You can't make everyone happy in the church. And I'll never forget, I was sitting there praying in tears. And God came down and said, when did I ask you to make everyone happy in the church? Preach his word. Do what I tell you. And I'll take care of the rest. Ask God for guidance. Ask God for what you would have be done. Proverbs 16, 9. A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. But we also see they not only ask God for guidance, but he obeyed God's commands. It's one thing to ask. It's another thing to do. You ever have someone ask you continually, hey, you know, hey, what would you do in this? And, and every time you tell them, they do complete opposite. After a while, hey, what would you have me do? It don't matter. I, I just tell people, it don't matter. You're going to do what you're going to do anyway. It don't matter. I got two or three people in my life. I love them. They're my friends. Uh, hey, Brad, we've been friends forever. I'm in a tight situation. What would you have me do? Man, you already got figured out before you called me. Just got to do what you're going to do. I'm not going to spend the next three hours trying to explain to you what you need to do, and you're not even going to listen to even my opinion. But yet, Paul here obeys God's command. Look what it says. Verse 8, Saul arose from the ground. He arose and he did exactly what God told him to do. Now, when he got up, he arose and he opened up his uh, eyes that said he saw no man. It means he was blind. He goes into this conversation with God with everything. He comes out completely blind. He can't see anything. Matter of fact, it says the men had to lead him where he needed to go. How would you like to, to be in a, re, in, a, in a, you just start a new relationship with someone and you're blind? Yeah, that's where Paul is. But did he get up and complain? Well, golly bum, you done blinded me. I ain't doing nothing you say. This ain't the way it's supposed to be. I'm Paul. I'm a leader in the church. I have paper and I have authority. God, you need to listen, you need to listen up and do like I'm saying. Now he got up. And he went to these men and said, look, this is what I must do. You see, it's not easy following God's command. When I was getting ready to come out here, a lot of my friends, I had some personal friends that said, look, there's a possibility I may be going to New Mexico. You're not really going all the way to New Mexico, are you? I said, as far as true, though, they said, is that, like, is that even a state? And you think y'all's education system's bad. <laughs> yes, it's a state. They actually speak English, most of them. But you're actually going to go if God, this is what God wants, I'll do it. They say, Brad, you make it sound so easy. It's not easy. Doing what God commands is not easy. 
It was hard leaving everything I've ever known. It was hard leaving my friends, my family. It was hard leaving, look, it was hard leaving just the, just the uh, geographical nature of it all. I lived in a place I never got lost anymore. Now, I mean, I'm, I, you know, I, the other day, the traffic was backed up. Goodness gracious, it can get traffic around here, can it? I mean, it's like waiting on Christmas. So I, the other day, I figured, Psh, I'm going to outfox all these folks. I'm going to take this little road because nobody's taking that road. It's got to lead to somewhere. Do you know on the other side of the river, all the railroads in at the river? So I'm sitting there looking at the road and I'm like, the reason they weren't taking that road, you idiots, because it didn't go anywhere. <laughs> Nothing like looking at a river with no water. Anyway. <laughs> but obeying God's commands. Folks, like I said, it, it's one thing to say, God, what would you have me do? But are you doing it? But pastor, some of the things that God asked me to do are hard. Yes, they're hard. Some of the things that God wants me to do may hurt someone's feelings. Probably. I don't think I preached a sermon yet that hadn't hurt someone's feelings. But pastor, I, you mean to tell me, what if, what if God calls me to another country and I got to live in a tent and eat bugs? You'll be happier living in a tent eating bugs and you will be living in the greatest home with the finest foods and being miserable in your heart. Joy is found in the heart. It's not found in the things of the world. He listened to God's command and then he was patient for the Lord's movement. A sign of converted heart is someone that's patient for God to move. Well, folks, I've been here long enough to know I, I Patience is, 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 uh, is probably not my greatest gift. I, I'm a go-getter. I know I drive my staff crazy. Let's, let's go do this. Let's go do this. Well, when do you want to do it? I want you to make a phone call today and find out what we can do to get this started. I am learning patience. And the problem is God has much more of it than I do. But we see in verse 9, and he was, <clears throat> he was there three days without sight, and neither did he eat nor drink. Notice this. Uh, Paul's waiting on the Lord. He never complained. He never complained the first time. He didn't sit there and say, God's got me sitting here waiting. Do doesn't God realize who I am? God knows who you are. Sometimes he makes us wait because he's trying to get the bugs worked out. Get the sin out. But for three days, and what did it say he did? He fasted. Why? In that time span, he was wanting to grow closer to God, not complain about him. You see, God's delay is not always God's denial. Many of you have heard that before. That's not new to me. But for those of you that have it, and I'll say it again so you can write it down. God's delay is not always God's denial. Sometimes the greatest place to be in God's presence is just waiting for God to move the next step. Everything is in right planning with him. I know in my own personal life, there's times I've kind of run ahead and I'm like, well, I'm going to do it this way. I'm tired of waiting. And man, I wish I had waited. I either messed things up or I missed an even greater opportunity. God knows exactly what he's doing and when he's going to do it. We need to wait on the Lord. Psalms 27, 14, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. A converted heart is one that has learned to wait on the Lord. And I know for some people that's not a hard task, and for some of us it is. But for those of us that truly love the Lord and have a converted heart, we understand that we're not going to rush God. But then we see a converted heart or a sign of a converted heart is one that publicly confesses to be the Lord's. You see, a truly converted heart desires to make it public to the world as to what Christ has done intimately in the heart. And that's baptism. Verse 18 says, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. When you go through verses uh, 10 and 18, there's a lot that's going on right there. 
And then once everything gets worked out the way God would have it to, Paul gets up and says, I want to be baptized. I want the world to know that I belong to Christ. What is that? That is through baptism. That's what we do here. And I thank God on a regular basis. It's letting the world know I'm different. I'm not what I used to be. I realize what I used to be. You don't have to tell me, folks, I know what I used to be. You know what you used to be. We don't need it all over the newscast to tell the world what you or I used to be. But that's not what we are anymore. We're different. We're new. It says, and fought with. He arose and was baptized. He went quickly. A converted heart doesn't have to wait around for 20 or 30 years to think about, I wonder if I need to get baptized or not. Well, folks, if you've never heard it, make sure you hear it today. You do. Christ not only commanded it, he exemplified it. Saying, follow in my footsteps. Do as I have done this day. And Christ was baptized, not because the people didn't know who's are the Lord's, but to show us what we must do to let the world know. I believe sometimes uh, people that have feel they have been saved and walked with the Lord many years and they just feel like they've never really connected, you missed a very important step. You see, no one would be ashamed to let the world know what's in their heart. Matthew 10, 32, save so everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. Philippians 2, 10, 11. So that the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the God of the Father. You see, everyone's going to confess Jesus. Whether they want to or not, everyone in the end, it's going to confess Jesus. No one will deny that he is Lord. But lastly, we see that a truly converted heart shares Christ to all. A converted heart wants to tell the world about Jesus. It doesn't condemn Jesus. It shares about Jesus. Um, Richard Nunez came into my office today with one of his workers. Oh, one of his, not his workers, <laughs> that's for wrong way of saying it, but a, a fellow employee and they came in and taught. And, and folks, let me tell you something. You're not going to step in my office and leave without me asking, do you know Jesus? That's just, my, that's just my MO. Well, preacher, don't you think that's offensive? You know what's even more offensive? Letting someone walk out and letting them burn in the pit of hell because you were more offended. You were more worried about them being offended than burning. Well, pastor, you just don't understand there's certain ways of doing things. You can do it as tactful as you need to, but a converted heart shares Jesus. And let me tell you something. Jesus shares his throne with no one. No other religion, no other great prophet, no other great anything. Either Jesus is who he said he is or he's not. And Jesus shares his throne with no one. Our word tells us that he's a jealous God. Folks, Jesus, and people are like, how can you love a jealous God? How would you feel if you gave the ones you loved everything and they said, I don't need this. I think I found a better way. I give my wife as much as I can. I'm not at the level of Ira, but I'm getting there. But here's the thing, folks. Not only would it break my heart, but I'm jealous. I would be ticked off if my wife put her eye on something other than me. Because I promise you, there's not another human being on the face of this planet that would do more for my wife than me. And I would give my life countless times for my wife. And many of you are the same way with your husbands and your wives. If we understand that kind of love, how much greater does Christ understand it? And we're to share that love. Folks, be weary of those that claim Jesus but refuse to share him. Be weary of those that say they're Christian but yet refuse to follow the word of God. 
Be weary of those that say they have a converted heart, but don't see, you don't see a converted life. The signs of a converted heart all starts with the very first thing I talked about as I close. A converted heart starts with being humbled. Acknowledging that God is greater than you or I. You see, I believe there may be some in this room this, this morning. You say, Pastor, what's my biggest issue in life? You've not acknowledged that greater, I mean that God is greater than you. You still think, well, I, I'm, I'm willing to allow God to do some things as long as he knows I'm in control. That's not a humbled heart. I'm willing to allow God to speak to me as long as he knows that, that me and him have to agree on some certain issues. God's not up there doing a contract. Well, what you want to agree with here, we'll work something out. He's already given you your contract. Either he's sovereign or he's not. God's not looking for someone that questions. God's looking for those that will follow a sovereign. And it starts with a humble heart. Simply saying, Father, I realize that your son is everything. Maybe this morning, the greatest thing that needs to happen in your life is to you to step out and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But I don't have all the answers. You're never going to have all the answers. Well, what if, if I'm a Christian, will I have all the answers? You're not going to ever have all the answers. Deuteronomy 29, 29, God says, the things that are not revealed to you, you're just not going to know. They're for me. But things that have been revealed to you are for you to know and to grow and to know more about me. You know what God's saying? There's things I want you to know. There's things I don't want you to know. And you got to learn to live with that. But pastor, that's not fair. We do our children the same way. We do others the same way. We understand that. I'm not going to get into a big talk with my boys on, on topics they just don't understand. That would just bring about confusion. We understand that. Does God not understand it more than we? So if you need to accept Christ this morning, you need to understand that you're not going to know everything, but you'll know the one that does. And he can change your life. And just like Paul on the road to Damascus, your life can change just like that. Pastor, I've got sin. He'll change it. Pastor, I've got issues. He'll change it. He'll change it. How does he do it? I don't know how he does it. He just does. And he can make all things better. And he can get you through all things, even if they're difficult. Because Christ will never leave you nor depart you. Let's go, Lord, in prayer.